Thank you. Thank you very much. It's very interesting to be at the uh, Naval War College. Uh, my wife uh, was commissioned from the Newport Women Officer School in 1973, and I was, uh, said, commissioned from Pensacola. We met in the Navy at the uh, Armed Forces Air Intelligence Training Center in Denver. So the old story, if the Navy wanted you to have a wife, they would issue you one. Well, they did. <laughs> Okay, um, I'm going to talk a little bit about some background as to how the Forrestal class came about. At the end of World War II, uh, the Navy had worked itself out of a job. America had a monopoly on atomic weapons and the Air Force regarded other services as anachronisms. In the meantime, the Navy was stressing the need for balanced forces and the importance of sea power in a post-war world, but struggled at the same time to develop its develop its own nuclear capability because if you wanted to be funded you had to be nuclear capable. Uh, at this time the Navy was coming out with its first guided missiles and naval aviation was struggling with several issues introducing jet aircraft to the fleet and the development of heavy attack aircraft that were capable of dropping the atomic weapons of the time which were quite heavy at the time. And the Navy's uh, response to developing nuclear capability was the supercarrier the United States and the idea was that it would operate a limited number of jet aircraft that were big enough uh, to carry the uh, atomic bombs of the era which are about the same same sizes were dropped by B-29s at the end of World War II. Now the keel was laid at Newport News on 18 April 1949 but it was canceled by Secretary of Defense Johnson five days later without even notifying the Navy. Now the, the Naval leaders saw this as a, uh, an attempt to monopolize nuclear warfare on the part of the Air Force and in what's known as the Revolt of the Admirals, uh, Naval officers attacked Johnson's policies in general and the Air Force claims that its uh, strategic bomber, the B-36, was a billion dollar blunder. Now, Johnson's cuts had not only affected the Navy, but they left all conventional forces short, and that includes Army, Navy, and tactical air. So they were ill-prepared to fight the limited wars that would come along in Korea. Now, in the meantime, while this controversy was being played out, uh, other possibilities arose, and that's what became the Forrestal class. Now, the Forrestal class was based in a lot of ways on the canceled United States, and the early concepts were very similar. The, the two ships, you see the artist uh, deception, uh, the United States, the Forrestal was very similar, except that it had an enclosed bow, and it was somewhat smaller. Now, as atomic weapons became smaller in size, so did the aircraft needed to deliver them. And when the Navy adopted the A3D Sky Warrior, at a 70,000 pound gross aircraft versus the 100,000 pound projected aircraft that the Navy thought it would need for the United States. It limited the, uh, the size of the carrier needed to carry the aircraft. And Representative Carl Vinson uh, suggested to the Navy a size limited general of about 60,000 tons. And that's what became the Forrestal design. Uh, Carl Vinson was long a time a friend of the Navy is known as Uncle <coughs> Carl within the Navy leadership. Now the purpose of the Forrestal design had changed from pure nuclear strategic strike aircraft by a few aircraft to a general purpose carrier with a larger air wing with smaller aircraft. But what saved the Forrestal design uh, and made it really effective was three British innovations. That was the angle deck, the steam catapult, and the mirror landing system, which uh, evolved into the optical landing system. Now, the original design was a flush deck, and both the Forrestal and the Saratoga were converted on the building ways to become angle deck carriers. And also, they decided to install an island. Now, when they adopted the island design, it solved a lot of their problems. The piping for the uh, exhaust gases was solved, um, the location of antennas, uh, the control of the ship, all kinds of things. Now, the electronics shown here, this is the Forrestal as she was commissioned, and that shows you uh, later in her career. 
Now the electronics on the first picture are the SPS-8 height finder radar atop the wheelhouse and an SPS-12 air search radar on the pole mast. And then the after uh, mast carried the electronic uh, countermeasures. And at the top of the mast is that dome-shaped thing is the uh, tactical air navigation beacon or TACN. Now a later view shows that uh, rectangular uh, radar, that is the SPS-48 medium range three-dimensional air search radar. Now the interesting thing about the uh, design was that the mast folded down. At the time it was a requirement for all major uh, warships that their mast had to fold so they could fit underneath the Brooklyn Bridge because uh -huh. the Brooklyn Navy Yard, uh, which <coughs> is the New York Naval Shipyard, uh, is commonly known, you had to fold down. So the main mast folded down, and you can see the hinge at the bottom of the picture, folded down to port and laid pretty much on the flight deck, and then the after ECM mast would fold aft. Now the uh, Forrestal had been ordered from Newport News Shipbuilding and Dry Dock Company in Newport News, Virginia. And the Saratoga was built in the New York Naval Shipyard, which is, like I said, commonly called the Brooklyn Navy Yard. Uh, one of the major differences uh, between the two ships is that Forrestal was originally completed with 600 pounds per square inch boilers, <coughs> which is the World War II era design. And the Saratoga was completed with 1,200 PSI, which subsequent ships all were completed to. And they're very similar in appearance. There's some details between the two ships. And like I said, they were both laid on as flush deck but converted during construction. Now this view shows the uh, Intrepid, the Saratoga and the Independence and it illustrates the relative of size between the Forrestal class and the earlier World War II era Essex class. It also shows a penchant that the Navy has for spelling out things on the flight deck as photo opportunities. And in this case it's the 50th anniversary of naval aviation in 1961. Now, Ranger and uh, the follow-on Independence were the same basic design. The most noticeable change, if you look at the stern, the stern is enclosed instead of the notch stern on the Forrestal and Saratoga. Uh, they also uh, had different design for the forward gun sponsons. Uh, they were different shape than on the Forrestal and Saratoga, and the Ranger was unique in that she retained those sponsons later on when the guns were removed. She also had an all-welded aluminum elevator on the port side, and she was actually the first ship laid down as an angle deck carrier. Now, the Ranger was built at Newport News, and the Independence was built at New York Navy Yard. Uh, now, this view of the Independence shows the, uh, taken during her April 1959 shakedown cruise. Now, it's an interim design on the flight deck pattern, and it's interesting, you can usually date a photo of a carrier by the aircraft that she carries aboard. In this case, A3D Sky Warriors on the fantail there, um, A4D Skyhawks, the little scooters, and F3H Demons, which is the um, ancestor of the famous Phantom, and F8U Crusaders. Now the Constellation was the follow-on, uh, excuse me, yeah, I think I have skipped a, ah, this is the Kitty Hawk, excuse me. Okay. Now the original design was based on the flush deck design, so there's a number of features that they corrected on the following class, which is the Kitty Hawk class. Uh, the port side forward elevator was moved aft, and the island was also moved aft, so you had two elevators in front of the island instead of two, island, uh, two elevators aft. Uh, that improved the usable space on the flight deck and it was a much better arrangement because the forward port side elevator interfered with both the landing area and the catapults on the, uh, the port side, the waste cats. Also it uh, introduced the more powerful C-13 steam catapults and it was armed with Terrier missiles for surface-to-air defense. 
Now, one other thing is the island had become so crowded with antennas that they introduced a lattice mast after the island to carry all the electronic gear. And this is a feature of all later classes of carriers. You'll see it in the Nimitz and follow-on classes. Excuse me. The Constellation was laid down in New York Naval Shipyard in Brooklyn, and it would be the last carrier built uh, someplace other than Newport News. Now, while she was fitting out prior to commissioning, a fire broke out in December 1960. Uh, firefighters extinguished the fire, but 50 uh, shipyard workers were killed. And it delayed the completion of the ship by seven months. Now, this overhead view uh, shows the constellation uh, in December uh, 1979 in South China Sea, and she's conducting underway replenishment with combat store ship Niagara. And on the other side is the guided missile cruiser Leahy. Now, following the uh, constellation was the USS Enterprise, the first nuclear powered ship. But because of cost overruns with the Enterprise, uh, she would be the only ship in her class. And she, she was originally supposed to be a leader of a class of six nuclear powered carriers. But because of cost, they decided no more. And this was the uh, McNamara era. So the next ship, uh, the America, would be conventionally powered. Now the changes from the Kitty Hawk included a bow-mounted uh, anchor and one astern instead of the usual port and starboard. And the reason for that was that she was equipped with sonar, the SQS-23. At the time, Soviet uh, nuclear-powered submarines were, attack submarines, were getting so fast that they figured they needed to provide uh, some kind of self-defense capability so that she was equipped with sonar. Now, uh, later on, the sonar was removed, but she was the only carrier that was completed with sonar. Other ships, when they were converted to anti-submarine warfare, were equipped with sonar. Now, she also had a uh, different island configuration, and you notice the narrow smokestack compared to prior units. And those drum-shaped antennas just forward of the stack there are the SPG-55. That's the fire control radar associated with her Terrier missile armament. Now, this is the Kennedy. And although she's similar to earlier ships, there were enough uh, differences that she's often um, put in a class by herself. Uh, the most significant changes were the different internal design. She was originally conceived as a nuclear-powered carrier, but it was decided to make her a conventional carrier. But her internal arrangement of spaces was uh, based on the uh, nuclear version of the ship. She also had, uh, was intended to carry a bow-mounted sonar and Tartar missile system, but because of cost factors, these weren't installed. And Kennedy would wind up being the last conventionally powered carrier built for the U.S. Navy. And another difference you'll notice is that the port side, the angle on the flight deck is uh, less of an angle than on earlier ships. And that's something that you'll see on all later classes of carriers, the nuclear carriers. Now here is a picture of the, uh, um, the Kennedy when she was going through her decommissioning ceremony in 2007. The top picture shows a bunch of blue-shirted uh, plane handlers up in what's called Vulture's Row. That's an area on the island where people can watch flight operations. And in this case, they were trainees, and they had to observe operations on the flight deck for a period of time before they were allowed to be on the flight deck. The flight deck uh, on a carrier is called the most dangerous four and a half acres on earth. And that is not uh, an exaggeration. Now as far as the weapons for these ships, uh, the original four stall class carriers had uh, four Mark 42 5 inch 54 automatic uh, dual purpose uh, mounts. And as the uh, threat increased, jet aircraft, cruise missiles, uh, guns just could no longer cut it. So uh, later <coughs> ships of the Kitty Hawk class were equipped with a RIM-2 Terrier missile. That was part of the Navy's uh, three Ts. They had the Talos, which is the biggest, 
Terrier, medium range, and then the Tartar was a small. And they had a range out to about 40 miles. Later on, um, these weapons were removed and the ships were modernized and they had uh, the NATO Sea Sparrow, which was adapted from the AIM-7 um, air-to-air missile. Uh, the Phalanx close-in weapon system, 20 millimeter Gatling gun, that was also adapted from an airborne weapon, the, the Vulcan. And later on, they adapted something called the rolling airframe missile, which is, it uh, rolls like a rifle bullet in order to stabilize its flight. And that was a later weapon system that was only installed on two of the, uh, these ships. All of the uh, current ships in the inventory are, are equipped with rolling airframe missiles. And they have been improved over years. Okay, now just as um, when you buy a DVD, you get the bonus features. These are your bonus features. Um, one of my last, last active duty for trainings in the Naval Reserve was an operational orientation aboard the Saratoga in July of 1993. And it was as the Saratoga worked up for her last deployment uh, before she got decommissioned. Now I need to explain a little bit about the ship's logo. Uh, the ship's emblem is the fighting cock and it was adapted to commemorate an event from the uh, Battle of Link Champlain during the War of 1812. At a critical point in the battle, a British shot had burst open the rooster's cage and the rooster got mad as hell and just crowed defiantly at the, at the British for, for damaging its cage. So the crew was so enheartened that they wind up, wound up defeating a larger British ship. So it's a, been part of their emblem ever since. Now, anyone who's ever seen a carrier in port uh, is usually impressed by the size in, of the ship. That's me as a, a younger version, uh, as a commander, <coughs> before the beard. And the flight deck uh, looks immense. When you're standing on the flight deck, you, it's, it's amazing how big it seems. But what most people don't realize is that when you're at sea, and there are a lot of airplanes parked on it, it does not seem big enough. Now, the captain of the ship is responsible for the readiness of his ship and crew, and they designate duties through the executive officer, XO as he's known in the Navy, the department heads, and the officer of the deck. Um, now, within departments are divisions which could range from a few dozen uh, sailors up to hundreds. And within the operations department, is the intelligence division, the OZ division. So the ship's intelligence officer is also known as the Wizard of Oz. And these are our happy reservists. Uh, in the background, the two officers are the um, prospective ship's intelligence officer and the outgoing ship's intelligence officer. And the chicken is Bob. Uh, Bob was the mascot of the, of the uh, ship's uh, intelligence division. And occasionally, um, the air wing would kidnap Bob and hold him for ransom. And they would send chicken wings to, <laughs> to the, to the uh, OZ division and say, if our demands are not met, you know, this is what's going to happen to Bob. So he started out being uh, um, an officer or chief. He had khakis. And then he reverted to enlisted rank. So he's wearing dungarees. And the Saratoga has. Uh, was in poor material condition by that time, and these were what my accommodations looked like uh, aboard ship. Now, the berthing areas for enlisted personnel are even more uh, daunting. Usually, uh, they have like three to four lockers per tier, and the locker space is very limited. And also at sea, anybody who's been at sea knows there's almost constant noise, uh, either from the ventilation system or on a carrier, if you're below the flight deck, uh, when the aircraft lands, you get a r loud kaboom. If you're up forward, and when the catapults go off, you get another loud kaboom. Uh, so it's a definite uh, hazard to your eardrums. Here's some examples of some uh, air operations with uh, Air Wing 17. In this case, it's an EA-6B from VAQ-132.
And over on the top left, you'll see the uh, optical landing system, which evolved from the original uh, mirror landing system that the British invented. You'll also notice the life nets, which go all around the carrier flight deck. Uh, you could get blown off the flight deck very easily, and those life nets have saved many a crewman because it's 60 feet to the water, and if you don't enter the water exactly right, it's like hitting concrete. And then that also shows the uh, jet blast deflector. And this is what the view looks like from the catwalk. And those uh, rubber bands that are along the catwalk, those are used to uh, seal off the uh, catapults when the catapults or air operations are not in use because it, um, they have a kind of a peculiar, waxy, greasy smell from the steam catapults. Now, another um, evolution before World War II, the Navy developed underway replenishment methods, and this gives the Navy great strategic mobility. Oddly enough, the one who pioneered this in World War I was the future Admiral Nimitz. And um, the British had a uh, method where they would trail uh, <coughs> behind the oiler and they would pass a hose. That's a safer, but the transfer rates are not good enough. And so the Navy developed an alongside uh, method. Now here the Saratoga is approaching the oiler Kalamazoo. Now the way we do it is the replenishment ship sets the base course and the ship that's receiving forms on them. And it's about 12 to 16 knots speed because that's about the optimum for ship control. Now when the receiving ship is alongside, uh, we have line guns that uh, send messenger lines to the oiler, or from the oiler I should say. And they are used to transfer other lines like the uh, uh, communications lines and the fuel hoses and, and things like that. Now this is not an easy evolution. Uh, the ships involved must hold the same course and speed and this is made more difficult by the fact that hydrodynamic forces tend to suck the two ships close together. Now when the replenishment is complete, the receiving ship breaks off and they also practice emergency breakaways in case they're surprised. Here's some more air operations. Um, this is kind of a swan song not only for the Saratoga but for a lot of the aircraft that are shown here. This is the F-14 from VF-103 and you'll also notice on the top left picture uh, F-18s. And here is a, um, I was in an E-6 squadron so uh, I have a soft spot in my heart for A-6s. It's an airplane, as I used to say, that only a bombardier navigator could love. Uh, and the top left-hand uh, side is the S-3B from VS-30. And that's equipped as a tanker. Uh, and you can see it uh, in position on the catapult here. Now that pretty much completes uh, how I spent my summer vacation. Uh, does anybody have any questions? <coughs> yeah, Sir? Could you uh, comment at all on carrier developments since this period that you feel are particularly significant? Okay, the, um, the Forrestal, as originally conceived, uh, would not have been successful if not for those British innovations. But if you look at the succeeding classes of nuclear carriers, it turns out to be just about the right size because it had plenty of room for growth and uh, there was enough hull to adapt to other developments, other technologies. So only now are we seeing real changes in technology. If you look at the Nimitz class, they're about the same size and they're the same configuration. So it was the Forrestal class really laid the foundation for all the succeeding carriers. Now with the, the Ford class and the new developments in technology like the magnetic launching systems and other developments, uh, we'll see how the, that works out. But the carriers that are in service now are all based on the success of the Forrestal class. Has the armament, armament, the defensive armament changed much? Um, what happens is it's, if you go back to World War II, 
the Navy and kamikazes, they looked at the air defense issue and the saturation raids. Well, at the end of World War II, they realized, okay, now we're going to face similar situation only with cruise missiles and jet aircraft. So you see how they go from gun armament to missile armament and dedicated escort ships that are equipped with missiles and also the naval tactical data system to correlate all that raw information so that you could react in time. And the later weapon systems like the rolling airframe missile system and the um, Vulcan phalanx and the Sea Sparrow are now integrated so that they cut down the reaction time in response to the growing threats. When they developed sea skimming cruise missiles, for example, that upped the game uh, from the attack side. So there's a corresponding response on the defensive side. And it's always evolving because the critics of aircraft carriers say, oh, they're just big targets. They're not so easy to kill. And the Navy doesn't stand still waiting for a Russian cruise missile design to take it out. So there's been responses over time. Sure. The Chinese uh, have <coughs> told us that the uh, day of the carrier is it's obsolete. Mm -hmm. They can sink anything with their right. missile. What are your feelings on that? They're building carriers. <laughs> they're, bu <laughs> they're building carriers, right. Um, that, that, that exact same argument has repeated, been repeated uh, since 1945 and around 1950 and into the 60s because, as I said, the threat evolves. And so the response has evolved. They've changed tactics. Uh, the Navy's tactic is to engage them as far out as possible and then also provide for that close in under the horizon attacks from sea skimmers and that sort of thing. So. Um, of the three na uh, na of the nations that have tried aircraft carriers, I'd say the three that really knew how to do it were the Royal Navy, the Imperial Japanese Navy, and the U.S. Navy. Other people have tried to build carriers. Some have borrowed carriers. There's a lot of uh, South American navies that have carriers. A lot of them regarded as sort of like a status symbol. But when it comes to something you can really use, I'd say the U.S. Navy is it right now. What do you, uh, when the, have they relied more on uh, like a GS cruise missiles, uh, cap, uh, frigates and that kind of thing as a cap instead of, Tomcat was a much better plane than the water is as far as putting a cap around the. Right. The Tomcat um, could stay a lot more, could carry a lot more armament. Right. Uh, Super Hornet. Well, the, it was the, I think the Navy's, from what I've heard of people talk, it's the Navy's fighter community that wound up killing the Tomcat because they didn't want to adapt it to other roles. Uh, what usually happens is you de develop an air defense fighter and it'll kill anything <coughs> that flies. And then, okay, now that we've killed everything that flies, what else are you going to do? So then you start doing, you know, land attack and, you know, anti-surface target type stuff. And so if you don't adapt to that, even if you're good at air, you know, air superiority, you, you don't have a future because you, <laughs> you shot everything out of the sky, so what's, what's your next? And uh, the folks who developed the Hornet were smart. Uh, they started with a lightweight. There was a um, design competition. The Air Force picked the F-16. The Navy chose what was the F-17 to develop into the F-18. And then they got smart. Now let's just scale it up. It looks like the same airplane from the outside, but it's a different airframe. And it's got more capability. Um, there is a tendency, you go back to look at how air groups were com uh, configured. They go from a lot of the same type of airplane down to more and more what they call overhead, specialized aircraft. And as things change, they, they, they go back and forth between one aircraft that's versatile and does pretty much everything down to, same thing happened to the S3. It, at the time, they were worried about submarines, so they came out with the S3. Well, we don't have to worry about the submarines so much anymore. The Soviet Union has collapsed. So what are we going to do? We're going to make it in a tanker. We're going to make it electronic warfare and eventually just phase it out. Yeah, well, they took 
the FAA section made a problem out of it. Yeah, and um, now they've taken the FAA, FAA EF-18 growler. Yeah. Oh, how many elevators were there on the Kennedy? Four. Four? Yeah. Uh, two and two? Nine. Well, no, it was two four to the island, one after the island, and one on uh, the port side aft. And that's a pretty much the configuration all the way through. How many uh, aircraft of the um, F-35 will that be? I really don't know how many um, are actually going to show up. Um, like the F-22 and the F-35 are these uh, wonder fighters that we, we go through an evolution in acquisition where we want to buy this new thing and it's got all the bells and whistles but then we can't afford enough of them so they project so many and it's going to cost so much per copy but then budget crunch time comes and then they cut back on the number which drives up the unit cost what's the range of that aircraft uh i don't know off the top of my head yes sir how essential is the e2c hawkeye to uh, airborne early warning and uh, looking for sea skimmers very. Um, there's probably development. The E2 is interesting that they keep uh, improving it. And I don't see the, as an overhead aircraft in the air wing, I don't see them getting rid of the E2 anytime soon because it's grown in capability over time. Yeah, they got nothing to replace it with. Right. The other question is uh, what, what do you think the drones are going to do now the study? They're having drones operational in carriers. Well, they have a similar issue between, the, like, say, the Army and the Air Force with drones. Um, it depends on whether you feel that manned aircraft still have a role in attacking surface targets. Because um, if your communications links are lost, you're out of luck. But if you've got a pilot in a cockpit, he can make decisions on the spot. So uh, the jury's still out on how effective drones will be. I know the Air Force likes to have their drones controlled by rated pilots, but, but that's a job security issue, not a strategic consideration. So, <laughs> Any other questions? Well, what class of um, carriers are being deployed now? Well, the Nimitz class, uh, the Enterprise has now finally been decommissioned. The Nimitz class and then the, the Ford class, and there's going to be follow-on. And they'll, the designs will evolve as they gain experience with the new technologies. They've so, got a, a lot of technologies they're trying out. So there's more than one class uh, being deployed now? Right now, uh, the Nimitz and her follow-on of the Ford class. I'm not sure. Um, the first couple are in commission, but the succeeding Ford class are going to be, they're going to evolve to have different technologies incorporated. I don't know the force levels right now. Sir? My understanding is that all, new, uh, all of your uh, carrier classes now are nuclear powered. Is that yes. Correct? Yes. Uh, that started in, um, back in, like I said, the McNamara era. Because at the time the enterprise was conceived, they had no idea what the actual advantages were because they had no data. And so uh, after the enterprise, all cost overruns, let's go to conventional power. Well, the advantages of nuclear power only became evident after they gained actual operational experience with the enterprise. And so McNamara became a convert. And that's how the Nimitz class came about. How does that new carrier under construction in the Norfolk area compare to these carriers? Um, I'd say size-wise and configuration, very similar. But as far as the technologies, I would have to uh, go specifically to, like, say, Newport News and get some specifics on. They're introducing a whole bunch of new, like, say, the arresting gear has not changed since World War II. It's essentially a hydraulic pulley system. Now, the only big change with the catapults was going from hydraulic, which had limitations, to steam. And now we're going to a magnetic system. 
So we'll have to see how that plays out because a lot of times the new technologies don't play out the way the artist concept, they usually show it works perfectly in the artist concept. But in practice, we'll, we'll see how it actually plays out. How does that work, that magnetic system? Um, I haven't uh, gotten the particulars on that yet. I can tell you about steam catapults. <laughs> <laughs> is, Virginia, is Virginia going to get all the business? <coughs> Newport News is the only game in town right now. I mean, is that really true? When you talk about the size of an aircraft carrier, uh, I'm not politics. No, no, I'm, I'm talking about there's not that many places that can even dock a, a ship that size, let alone have the expertise to build it. So I don't own any stock in Newport News, but what has happened over time is that we used to have multiple sources for major warships, but now we don't, and it's a matter of the industrial base. So one well-placed bomb down there in Newport, and you're, you're out of business. But well, th that could be said for a, a lot of uh, things for infrastructure, not just shipbuilding. So. Uh, how many uh, carriers are in active use today on the various waters? Um, the, num the force level carriers is va uh, varied from like... 10 to 15, depending on what Congress authorizes, and then the number of air wings associated with them is varied. And I don't have the current force levels off the top of my head either. So, so only 15? Or? Well, it, it depends. Um, because you have um, so many carriers that are deployed, they go through a cycle where it's like six months uh, getting worked up in the dock, and then a workup cycle for so many months, and then deployed for six months. And then they rotate out. And then occasionally you have major overhaul. So I would have to uh, probably go to the la latest version of Naval Aviation News and, and look at the at sea with carriers with the carriers and see how many are actually out there right now. Are we going to have a problem with naval aviators? We're going to be able to fill the fill a requirement. Are we, are we working at it? Well, I don't think there'll be uh, an issue. This is personal opinion. I don't think there'll be an issue with supply and, and demand. Um, the real issue will be is if, if we all go to all drones, okay, who's going to want to be a naval aviator if, um, <laughs> if it's all run by kids sitting at a console? Um, Are they going to call them naval aviators? <laughs> they'll probably be operational specialists or something. Uh, that's a kind of a service cultural call. Right. That's they could save money on the, pay, on the payroll. Actually. Right. Well, um, a lot of times in history you'll see they run short of pilots because of changes in the political climate and, or economics. Like, say, during the Vietnam War, they had a pilot shortage because guys were fighting an air war with one hand tied behind their back and airlines were hiring. So, so why should I get shot at for, you know, not very good results? when I could get out of the Navy and make, make good money as an airline pilot. And then when the airlines are having trouble, you know, people would tend to stay in. You're not going to get drones to res for rescue like helicopter. Well, yeah. <laughs> a lot of times you, you can't do that. Well, okay, here's a, a joke that, uh, that my Hilo friends say. Uh, how do most Hilo pilots view fighter pilots? Cold, wet, and scared. <laughs> uh, any other questions? Oh, yes. um, when they when they phase out a particular group of planes, um, what um, decisions do they make with the the ones that that are remaining, the recycling, uh, that sort of thing? Well, for the aircraft, they usually wind up at Davis Monthan, uh, and for the aviators and naval flight officers, uh, a lot of times they transition to another community or you know they, they put their time in um, and they retire. Um, what happens with some of them, um, the Navy is unique uh, in that naval flight officers are eligible to command units that will lead to flag rank. Uh, because back in the 30s they passed legislation that said if you're going to command um, 
carrier units or aviation units, you have to be aviation qualified. Now they, they made it for naval aviators and what they called naval flight observers and then became naval, naval flight officers. So they get the ticket punches in the different billets so that they can command squadrons and air wings and that sort of stuff. So there is a career path for them. Now if your community gets eliminated, that tends to cut down your chances for transitioning to something else. What kind of horsepower would be required to bring a carrier up to 40 knots? Well, I think the, uh, the Forestall class was uh, 280,000 uh, horsepower. I'd have to look in my book. But uh, you're talking 30 plus knots. Um, you've got hydrodynamics involved too. Um, the Enterprise originally there was, you know, kind of naval myth that uh, the Enterprise could really book. She had eight nuclear reactors and there's all kinds of sea stories about she just takes off and choo, the rooster tail out the back. But I, I don't think, I think a lot of that's either classified or sea story. Why sea story? Well, <laughs> I, I know they, they over-designed the, the Enterprise because she had two uh, <coughs> reactors because they weren't sure you know, how it would work out technology-wise. All the newer ones have got improved reactors, but there's only two of them. So. At what point in the construction of the carrier did they adopt those uh, Royal Navy changes? Um, they were laid down um, and it was adopted before they got um, to the point where the, the changes would have major disruptions. Have there, there have been other conversions where they've had to cut back what yeah. they've done in order to, to do the modernization. But I don't know how far along they got when they made the decision to complete them as uh, mm -hmm. angled deck carriers. But what happened is some of the design features were just too hard to, to reconfigure, like the elevator arrangement. And so that's why the uh, Forrestall and uh, class had the uh, elevator arrangement it did, because it was sort of based on the, the des hull design for the flush deck carrier. You know, one thing you forgot when you're talking about the high line transfer, movies. <laughs> That's the most important thing that goes across. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I have a C. Who's at, who's at the receiving end to sort them out? I have a C story for you. I was uh, VA-115 VA as a squadron intelligence officer, and at one point the squadron's uh, mascot was Clyde the Camel because when the squadron had transited the Suez Canal back in the 50s, they adopted the call sign Arabs. And so Clyde the Camel was of course our mascot. And when the uh, squadron converted from A1s to A6s, they got some 16 millimeter footage of Clyde the Camel in the Seattle Zoo. <laughs> you know how camels are. And we were gonna watch Clute, which was the Jane Fonda, uh, Donald Sutherland movie. And we had to first pick uh, the movie. And they had an embarked staff, the Admiral staff. They were just aboard for a short while. So they said, the Admiral wants to see Clute. Well, I don't think the Admiral did. I think one of his aides did. So we were all grousing in the ready room. And one of our officers uh, said, you know what we ought to do? We ought to splice him a Clyde right in the middle of the film. <laughs> so we got Clyde, you know, 16. We pulled out several feet of Clyde. And we got some one of the... Uh, photo text to splice it into the middle of one of the reels from Clute. We sent it up to the flag ranks. Never heard a word back. <laughs> <laughs> Next day, they had already, you know, come and gone. It was like one of those fly-by-night things. So, so we got, next movie night, the ready room was packed, and we're watching Clute. And it's a dramatic scene where someone is stalking, you know, her and and Donald Southern is like going up to the rooftop and he opens the door and there's Clyde going ah, 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 ah. <laughs> <laughs> So that's my movie C story. Time for one last question. Anybody? All right. Like thank, thank you. you very much.